So first of all, uh, my name is Anne Mettler, and I'm the head of the European Political Strategy Center. I apologize, I was supposed to be here uh, this morning, um, uh, but as you know, there are many changes underway, and uh, so that prevented me uh, from being with you, but I know that you were in excellent hands uh, here with Pavel, and I heard uh, that, uh, that you had very, very uh, good discussions, and so we look forward to continuing this now uh, in the um, afternoon. Um, so this session in particular will uh, sort of provide a deep dive into um, how digitalization can be harnessed to uh, drive uh, productivity. And um, I think this issue came up already this morning, but now is an opportunity to really zoom in because it's uh, obviously such an important issue. So we have an excellent panel uh, with us uh, this afternoon, really sort of balancing the perspective of some of Europe's best performing companies uh, and emerging stars, uh, but also the perspective of the European uh, Investment Bank. Uh, and uh, the EIB, of course, conducts regular investment surveys across the EU, which provide a wealth of uh, unique firm level uh, information uh, about all kinds of things. Uh, and I think, I mean, I've always said we need better, more granular data in this discussion, much more at firm level. So it's wonderful that we can have that this afternoon. So let me briefly introduce uh, our speakers. So we first, uh, we have uh, Deborah uh, Revoltella. She's a director of the economics department at the European uh, Investment Bank. Um, we also have with us uh, Thorsten Zube, um, um, uh, head of the Innovation Center Network at SAP, and uh, Ulrich uh, Striedbeck, uh, he's Vice President and Head of Group Regulatory Affairs at uh, Orsted, um, to my far left, and also Jan uh, Last Lastufka, he's CEO and co-founder of uh, Monkey uh, Data. So, um, as in previous sessions, you will also have an opportunity here to, to ask questions, of course. And uh, so, but without further ado, uh, let me ask uh, Deborah to start her presentation. I've been told you each have seven minutes. And uh, for those of you who know me, uh, know that I take this very seriously. And with that, I hand over to you, Deborah. Come on. So thank you very much, and uh, it's uh, it's really a pleasure to to be here and uh, and uh, to be the first speaker in this uh, panel addressing the issue of uh, digitalization and uh, support uh, to productivity. I will go um, I will go through uh, a number of uh, slides very quickly and uh, pointing to the main message. And I think the main message is. Uh, that uh, from our analysis and our work, uh, we see that uh, there is uh, a cost of delaying uh, the digitalization uh, um, strategy, and uh, there is a, a cost of delaying, and uh, Europe is uh, showing uh, some, uh, some sign of delaying, uh, particularly in the service sector, in the di digitalization, and we think that uh, on a policy point of view, because uh, this uh, cost of delaying uh, may become permanent, I will explain it later uh, better, uh, we really need uh, to do something in order to avoid uh, to pay this uh, cost uh, of uh, delayed uh, digitalization. Where I'm coming from, uh, it's uh, coming uh, from our uh, study on uh, investment in Europe. We publish every year, and uh, as Anne Mettler was saying, uh, we have a wealth of data that uh, comes uh, from um, commonly available data. We sum up uh, with our own survey of uh, European, now American firms, uh, that allow us uh, to have a grasp uh, of uh, what is uh, really happening on the market. This is showing uh, something uh, that we have been talking also before, is showing uh, uh, the uh, top 2,500 firms at the world level in terms of R&D spending. I go very quickly, so I only concentrate on uh, the blue bar. The blue bar is uh, showing uh, the firms uh, that we call uh, new to the group. So those uh, that enter the group of uh, the top 2,500 uh, 2, global spender in R&D. And here uh, what you see is uh, that uh, Europe uh, is uh, lagging behind uh, quite a lot versus US uh, and uh, recently, more recently China, in terms of uh, 
creating a new, new giants uh, that are uh, the new global leader in R&D spending. What you see is uh, that uh, Europe is keeping uh, the old ones, uh, but is uh, difficult in Europe uh, to create uh, the new. So it's really this issue of uh, dynamism uh, of uh, the European uh, um, European uh, business environment uh, that we have uh, been discussing uh, since uh, this morning. And I would uh, like to ask, add uh, that uh, dynamism also include uh, reallocation of resources uh, that has uh, the, new, the nice component of uh, creating the new, but also requires uh, the reallocation and so the exiting of the old. So this is uh, something uh, that is uh, quite important. If uh, we look at investment, uh, EU versus US, in the last uh, 20 years, more or less, uh, these are macro data. What you see, everybody is always talking about uh, Europe uh, is not investing enough uh, in, uh, in intangible assets. Uh, there is a 1% gap in the last uh, 20 years. But what is interesting is also what happened after the crisis, after the financial crisis, consequences, uh, the, the sovereign debt crisis in Europe, a new gap has opened also in investment in uh, machinery and equipment. Why is it important? Uh, again, uh, because uh, we are in time of uh, technological change. Machinery and equipment and intangible are both extremely important uh, and speed in transformation is key. Here uh, we look at uh, our survey data and uh, we ask uh, firms if they know several digital technology different uh, for manufacturing and service sector and if uh, they have been adopting them and if they have been transforming the company around them. That. What do we see? Manufacturing sector, uh, Europe and US are at par. Service sector, uh, Europe is uh, lagging behind in terms of adoption of technology. I will go more granular later, but uh, the message uh, that we get is uh, that uh, there is uh, some gap in adoption in the service sector of uh, digital technologies. There is a consequence, and I go to the second graph. We ask uh, to the firms uh, whether they believe, uh, so it's uh, the, it's uh, <laughs> it's uh, the CEO, so we have <laughs> telling us, uh, not you specifically, but uh, does the digitalization has an effect on the firm and uh, does it impact uh, in terms of uh, sale in this case? Uh, yes, uh, they all tell us it has a positive impact uh, and it has a possibly positive impact, uh, so a causality on the sales side, but we also, uh, through our analysis, uh, we look at a stronger correlation uh, with a total factor productivity, investment, innovation of the firm. So yes, uh, digitalization is important, is important uh, for the firms, uh, and Europe is lagging behind in the service sector. There is uh, something uh, that we call uh, winner takes all. This is a very complex graph, uh, and uh, in my seven minutes, I don't think I can really explain all of it. But uh, basically, we have uh, on the horizontal axis, uh, we have uh, firms uh, that are non-fully digital or fully digital ordered uh, by total factor productivity. On the very right, uh, you see the more productive in each group. And then uh, what you see is basically we ask uh, to the firms whether they think uh, that uh, digitalization will lead uh, to more competition in the market. And uh, all the firms uh, that are not the last uh, they think uh, no, they, they, they think uh, that, uh, sorry, yes. The one at the top of the top, so the more productive among the fully digital, they don't fear any more competition. So it's uh, this uh, winner takes all, uh, that uh, the firms uh, that are the first digitalizing, uh, they get uh, the best one, uh, the most productive one, at uh, the very end, uh, they think they are protected, uh, they are market leaders and they will not be contested. So all of this uh, gives us uh, a message. Europe is uh, somehow lagging behind in the service sector. There is uh, an advantage for the firm in terms of productivity innovation to di di digitalize. And if you don't do it quickly, you may be locked out, uh, not able to compete anymore. That calls uh, for Europe uh, to really be serious in terms of uh, supporting digitalization of firms. We look at uh, what are the constraints to digitalization. We ask uh, to the firms uh, what's the main constraint to digitalization. Main constraint is uh, skills, availability of skills. Second constraint is still some factor on uncertainties. We also have a business, we ask the first one, uh, so uh, each firm has to select one. There is uh, something also for business regulations, slightly more in the service sector, because I think we always go back to the fact that Europe in the service sector still doesn't have a fully integrated market. When we, ask, uh, when we try to understand uh, which uh, firms are lacking behind in the digitalization, 
other than saying on the service sector, there is a very important uh, different message. It's very much uh, the small, uh, micro and medium, which is clear, but uh, what is even more important is uh, the old firms. So what you have is uh, Europe is able to generate uh, young, innovator sta startup that are super digital and they are leading. What, where is uh, the lagging part? Is really in a part of uh, the small and medium that are uh, the old small and medium company that uh, don't know how to do it, so they don't digitalize. <laughs> And this is uh, something that on a policy point of view you have uh, to consider. If you have a number of firms uh, that uh, in Europe and in some countries of Europe are uh, the big part of the system that are these uh, medium, small, old firms that uh, don't digitalize also because uh, they don't know how to do it, uh, maybe policy intervention is quite important. And we come, and I come to the last. And uh, my last message is, on a policy point of view, what do we need to do? I think it's uh, very important for Europe to take the digitalization is issues very seriously and try to address a policy to front load, to go fast. Firms may go there, maybe if we give them time in the long term, but they need to do it fast and not to be locked out for this winner-take-all element. What do we have to do on a policy point of view? I think uh, there is uh, something to do in terms of financing, important, but it's not all. If you want uh, to address uh, the medium old firms, uh, you probably need uh, to do a lot of advisory, help uh, the firm understand uh, what uh, they need uh, to do. And uh, that's uh, one important element. There are things uh, related uh, to the single market. Uh, we know it uh, since 20 years, uh, particularly in the service sector, particularly with uh, the digitalization. This will be a crucial disadvantage uh, for European firms. Uh, so it's uh, the moment uh, really to move. And then, uh, sa same message than ever, uh, dynamism in the business environment, entry exit of firms. Uh, and then uh, big important questions uh, that are related uh, to cyber security, big data regulation uh, that uh, will determine uh, if uh, Europe uh, will be a competitive market uh, and, uh, uh, and um, a good market uh, for operation uh, for the large digital firms. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Deborah. That was fascinating and it was actually perfect that you went first because you very much uh, set the stage. Um, I think, I mean, the, on this time element uh, that you speak about, uh, that's very important, but it's, you know, I mean, we are 20 years now into the um, digital revolution, and uh, so we have already lost a lot of ground. Uh, so at least part of that discussion is also, how do we change things now, you know, that we have companies that sit on piles and piles of data, and uh, to the extent that we have these young companies, usually they're just being bought up. I mean, very few of them, uh, make it uh, to to uh, to a decent size, uh, which is actually the perfect segue to our next speaker, who is Torsten, because um, we always mention in our paper, Torsten, that the, the, the last time that Europe really produced a sizable multinational company was actually SAP in the year 1972. Uh, so, um, you know, you're absolutely right uh, when you say that we have not been able to produce these kind of new companies uh, that really can scale up and can become truly uh, global uh, leaders. Uh, but yours is one of them. Makes it all the more important to hear what you have to say in, I repeat, seven minutes. Thank you. Um, thank you. And before I start, I would like to thank everyone, the panelists before, for the inspiring discussions. Uh, very helpful. And I want to emphasize, um, since 72, we have done more innovation things, even this year. <laughs> so just you know, to be clear about that. Um, digitization, I mean, we have talked a, uh, a lot about that, and I mean, it's, it's clear that this is a cornerstone of every company. To every single person I've talked to for the last years, independent of it's a big company, a small company, or even a very small company, a medium company, they all agree it's super important for them, and digitization is an essential part of their strategy. So, but digitization is not just a sensor, connectivity, and a little bit machine learning you put on your existing processes. To optimize the processes, to get the little rest out of the processes where you still have some manual processes. Digitization must be more fundamental. What do you mean with that? If I 
I have a technical background, but if I look into enterprise systems and I look at the data, the structures, the processes, so what I see is it's a one-to-one -one abstraction of the real world, and this is how we build software all the years before. So we looked in reality, we tried to understand it, we, co uh, we copied it into a digital world, and then we tried to optimize it by taking out manual steps. But that means we are still operating on processes, I'm a little bit <laughs> sarcastical here, but they last there for 500 years. So what I think, we have to turn this around, and we have to start to design processes in the digital world first, and then to adapt them to the real world. And we have talked a lot today about adaption uh, of technology, and what do you need for that is three things. First, you need to have a deep understanding of emerging technologies. Not only understand how you can apply it to your today world, you have to understand, you have to get inspired about technology, what it can do, how it can change your uh, processes, how it can even disrupt your business, which sometimes is hard to do. Second, you need to have supporting policies, because at the end of the day, and we also have had this uh, this morning, it's not just about to see in a lab what is possible. At the end of the day, we have to get it down in, in the real world. And if we change the way we operate, the policies won't work anymore, because even that I heard today, and uh, back to the centuries ago, we have to do that together. And third, it's about innovation leadership. So let's go a little bit back to technology, and I will, will go through all of them. We have four more minutes, this is great. Um, technology, I mean, we have seen so many, so many stats today, but I just take a few, but what usually people come to me and they say, okay, Torsten, you know what, I've just read that only two out of the top 30 research institutes are out of Europe. If it comes to articles published in journals, it's just one out of the top uh, 30. If I, we have heard today, which I found amazing, I haven't seen that number yet, but it seemed like 90% of the biggest brains in AI are coming from Europe, right? Now what I've been told is 90%, so 60% of the investments in AI is in China and 30% in, in the US, which, which uh, I'm sorry, which makes 90% of the investment after we have an idea what to do, now go somewhere else. But at the end, it's not only about to understand the technology, it's about to make it happen and to apply it. And now, understanding where, when you need to, uh, uh, to, 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 um, to implement software, it becomes clear where talents go. And Adam, you made a very good point this morning when you said the talents go where the environments are. And it sounds not sexy, but environments can be built with money, and we need this up front to build these environments. But then we have to be wise to build them in the right way, and you also mentioned out a few things that are very important that I comp uh, totally comp uh, uh, copy. And at SAP, we also have a central department for emerging technologies, how we can adapt them. And just talking about AI, we made the decision that we put our focus domain, the team, not in Waldorf, not in Potsdam, but we put it in California. It's because where the people are. It's because where the people want to. And we even send people from Europe there because we have, the, we have them here, but they want to live there. So some people say, Torsten, are we screwed? Is there hope? Yes, there is. And I'm absolutely convinced. Because, I mean, you could, you, you could have doubts if you look at this way and if you now try to run after. What we have to understand is that the European Union has a unique value proposition. And we also ma mentioned that today, I've heard this today, and unfortunately I can't remember, it was trust. It's trust because we, when we talk about digital, we talk about data. Data, we talk about people. We talk about data privacy, we talk about how ethical aspects, how we treat data, and I think we are at the forefront here at the European Union. We have these rules already in place. Yes, I know, as a kind of, um, Oh, no, it's going backwards. I'm still within the seven minutes. I was just shocked that it's red. Um, <laughs> I, 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 leading the innovation department of SRP, yes, I have to agree. Sometimes it's really, really hindering. Okay, you can't do this. Um, the lawyers tell you it's not possible, but you really want to do it. But that should not be the problem, not to do that, not to consider, be to, because ignoring these things, will, we will definitely fail. And we see the first things in the US, what, what's happening if you completely ignore these facts. But this comes me to the second point. It's about supporting policies. 
And the one thing that I really would like to ask everyone here to understand, we cannot start with the policies when the technology is done. We have to start together with the technology. It's about understanding technology and understanding policies at the same time. And sometimes I even think we should start with policies first before we even invest into technologies. But probably it's, it's a, but it's a together. And that brings me to innovation leadership. And I also heard this this morning and I was super happy about this. Because innovation is about being brave. It's about seeing, having a vision, believing in something and driving that. And usually when I ask people, where do you see innovators? They say in startups. They say sometimes in innovation centers. So I call myself a little bit as one. But I think that's wrong. Everyone has to be an innovative mindset. Policies maker have to see some that themselves as an innovation leader. Uh, leader. Because if, you, if everyone says, from, even from a policy side, I believe in something like that. I think it's important. And we should not wait until we have the technical proof for that. Let's start now to see how we could change certain regulatory things. If in case we can make it happen technically, that we are there, then we all win. So it's about three things. We need to understand technology and we, we need to apply it in the European Union. Second, we need to get policymakers on board from the very first day. And third, we all of them have to act and behave and feel and live as innovation leaders. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was extremely uh, interesting. Also because it sort of describes a side of innovation uh, that is not often enough to, uh, talked about. Because so often we equate it just with R&D or just with uh, you know the brains that we have in Europe. But what you really make crystal clear is that's not enough. It's really very much about the ecosystem. It's about how companies function. So all of that is uh, very well uh, taken. And uh, by the way, the good news is I think there's huge scope for improvement. Uh, and I think at the end of the day, Europe does have a very high quality of life. Hmm? And that uh, if people have a choice, you know, we can make it more attractive. So very, very good and lots to discuss uh, later on. But first we come to Ulrich, please, for his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. I have, uh, I don't think I've ever spoken about productivity or digitalization before, actually. I used to come to energy confer conferences. Uh, so I'm very excited. Uh, 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 Ersted, that is a, a Danish based uh, utility. Uh, we used to be a fairly normal utility, but today we are the global leader in offshore wind. I think we've built around 25, 30% of the global offshore wind outside of China. A market cap of around uh, 30 billion euros, thereabout, uh, making it uh, one of the most uh, valuable companies in Denmark and um, you know, a sizable company in Europe uh, scale as well. Uh, and that's probably a quadrupling of our market cap in five years, six years. So I think we uh, are doing pretty good. And uh, digitalization is certainly a very important part of, of uh, what we've done. First, uh, not least to make myself uh, comfortable, a, a slide uh, from my world, uh, the energy world. But this is actually also the crux about what this is uh, to us uh, of digitalization and productivity. We uh, uh, were dealing with a technology offshore wind that were far too expensive, not that long ago. And people thought we were a little bit crazy. Uh, but uh, the cost of offshore wind has come down with more than 60% uh, in uh, five, six, seven years. Making offshore wind together with other renewable technologies uh, competitive with the, uh, the technologies that are conventional and are which uh, the fossil ones are the ones that uh, policymakers, societies want to get rid of. So this is where this fits in for us. And then uh, what I usually do, uh, speaking about a subject, is that I have my team make me some slides and they come back to me with some slides in, in principle about digitalization. Uh, I didn't want to do this uh, this time. I don't think this is what you were after. So what I did instead was that I, I went do, down to our uh, basement, the first floor. Uh, that's where we have our digitalization team. And it's called, uh, the room is called Dungeons and Dragons. 
And when you walk in there, you see Coca-Cola bottles and uh, flags and posters and uh, lots of T-shirts. I can, I can assure you, no, no ties. And uh, that's where they do their stuff. And uh, we have been speaking about this, making very big decisions, top-down decisions about digitalization, uh, of course, for many years, about innovation, of course, for many years. But uh, our lesson has very much been that making decisions like that top down, you can also very easily end up for a company like mine having very, very intelligent uh, people develop extremely intelligent solutions that we don't really need. So what these guys do in Dungeons and Dragons, they go to the business and ask them, what do you want? You know, what, do you, what is it that you dream about in your sleep? Uh, and a couple of examples of what uh, my offshore wind colleagues, they dream about and what they s fixed in Dungeons and Dragons. Very, very important for offshore wind is that whatever takes place offshore costs a lot of money and it's very complex. So we have, uh, b before, we had, uh, for example, blade inspections uh, done manually people hanging upside down in ropes and photographing. I've seen it. It's, 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 it's crazy. <clears throat> uh, today, what we're, what, where we are at now is that we are inspecting uh, with drones, of course, and managing that as a system. Uh, we move from something that takes a day to something that takes uh, 18 minutes. Uh, we have... Uh, 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 also, or we are developing, I'm, I'm not sure we are quite there, but we are getting there uh, also of uh, finding ways of actually doing something about it when we find uh, a, a problem uh, and main, to, to maintain uh, uh, the blade. Uh, second type of, of uh, example is uh, very much from the da uh, world of uh, big data. Uh, when a offshore wind farm, when a, an offshore wind turbine breaks down somewhere, uh, it stops. It stops automatically. And you have to find out what's wrong, and you have to get that spare part and sail out there, have some people uh, on board, and fix it. Uh, so while it stops, it costs lost revenue, and uh, doing it uh, costs money. What we, have, what we have done now in more and more parts uh, through monitors, through uh, lots and lots and lots of monitors, uh, uh, measuring uh, vibrations, sounds, all kinds of things, and learning uh, 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 what, how, how does a, a spare part that is just about to break, how does that behave just before it breaks? And when we detect the problem uh, with an offshore wind, uh, wind turbine, when we are already out there, uh, we fix it before it breaks. Uh, and it has saved us uh, a lot of money. It, it saves us uh, a lot of money. So some very, very tangible uh, examples of how we use this. But we are, of course, uh, using it uh, in many, many, many other areas and uh, our suppliers uh, delivering the turbines and other uh, uh, pieces of equipment, they are also uh, very, very quickly developing a host of uh, digitalization tools uh, here. Um, I liked, uh, I appreciated uh, very much uh, what, what you talked about uh, in, a, in a SAP context before. Uh, to me, digitalization is very much uh, the culture and how it creeps in. And uh, just a, a, sm a small remark that I, I, I actually think matters is that our, our CEO, he just started to communicate to people uh, also through Yammer uh, because uh, the people offshore, they, are, they don't read our uh, intranet and uh, stuff like that. They're hanging upside down. No, not so much anymore. But uh, uh, so he, he has started to uh, go take to uh, social media and uh, uh, 
you know, to, to, to get the mood there. I'm being told to, to shut up. Uh, what, what does this mean to Europe? Here is a slide, finally, that shows uh, what does it take to decarbonize Europe by 2050. The European Commission has laid out scenarios for how to do that. Offshore wind is meant to play a significant role in that. And we, uh, offshore wind is growing uh, a lot, but we are only just started. So for this to be kept together, be affordable, be cheap for, for ratepayers uh, to make European ind industry uh, competitive, uh, digitalization will have to be uh, a, a, a very, very important role uh, going forward. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, and uh, also congratulations. It's a great company, and uh, you know who knows what we'll be saying about your company in the future, about the next uh, big thing, may maybe the next big company coming out of Europe. Uh, but more seriously, I mean, what both of you um, uh, spoke about now, Thorsten and uh, Ulrich, is essentially a better understanding of what actually happens sort of at firm level and the culture. I mean, what you try to describe, the role of uh, digital teams in the firm, et cetera. I think it's not sufficiently understood. I mean, in terms of public policy, it's still very rudimentary, the discussion. It's sort of SMEs and large firms. I mean, already I think what uh, you spoke about, Deborah, and also Dirk uh, this morning, even though I wasn't here, frontier firms and laggard firms, I mean, that we, we, we need to develop a new vocabulary uh, to, to understand better what happens at firm level data, because uh, otherwise we will never get a, a, get a grip on uh, many of these important issues. Now, uh, last but not least, uh, we go to Jan uh, for his presentation, please. Hello everyone, hear me? Just like this. Okay, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm very glad as a like CEO of startup to be a great event like this. Just a quick exercise after the lunch. Please raise your hand. Uh, I have a, qu a quick question for my personal research. Are you afraid of AI future? Yes? No? Perfect. Because I uh, spoke at several conferences, uh, it was like future of AI was the name of the conference, and like 90% of the people were afraid of that. So I can let's cancel that event because we don't, don't know nothing to talk about. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, one minute is lost. Okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you, Deborah, for a great intro for my presentation. I, I don't know if it works. Yes. Today I want to show you briefly uh, and tell you the story about Monkey Data which is like a real adventure and journey. And I'm a chief monkey, so I'm proud to, proud to be here. And, uh, but uh, the main topic of my presentation is about SMEs, and I want to tell you more about problems of our customers and show you how these guys can solve, can help us to solve uh, maybe the main question, which is the innovation, productivity, and so on, and especially how policymakers and, and how can technology help them to be successful. So. Um, what we do, we basically made, uh, we are like SaaS company, we made software uh, for data analytics for SMEs, micro and small, uh, online stores, e-shop uh, globally. We are based in Czech Republic, we are proud of it, and so we are still based in EU and uh, uh, we have European uh, in, uh, investors, VCs, and, but thanks to technology and thanks to digitalization, we are able to operate uh, in more than 30 countries and uh, our services are uh, used by more than 100,000 customers uh, globally around the world uh, in the last five years. So it was like, uh, as I mentioned, a ni nice journey and a lot of value of that we went through and, and it, was, it was still great. And, uh, uh, but as I mentioned, I want to talk about the customers. Our customers, they are not large companies, not corporations, uh, they are guys like looks like this, you know, hipsters, passionate people, people who want to do something. Uh, we, uh, we have, um, uh, our customers are owners or managers of, of online stores, but they open their own online store. I mean, this is a mom and pop stores with socks for the babies, you know, with t-shirts for babies. Two people, they want to sell their own bikes, they want to sell organic uh, cotton, organic food, anything else, so people with a story. 
And I love them because uh, they have incredible passion to do something. They have incredible energy. And I believe uh, they are future of economics. And um, uh, there are 40 million online stores globally. They, uh, and people like this, they do something. They, they want to do something and they want to change something. And I think um, I want to show you how we, how we help them through the data. Uh, because we provide them the data, data analytics solution, which is really simple. And this, this is the most important thing that I want to tell you today. Uh, these guys, uh, they love technologies. I want to show you two numbers um, as a, as a, like, uh, from our research. But uh, as I mentioned, they are passionate. They, are like, they, have like, they have to invest all of their energy into all the processes in the company. So they need to have a services which are really able to use, easy to use, uh, which are really easy to understand, but uh, which are smart. And this is what my previous speakers mentioned. Uh, it's all about ad adoption. And these guys, these are regular people. You know, they, they don't have a BI teams. They don't have a teams. They implement some technology into their companies. They are, they are alone or with some friends and, uh, and making the business. So they need to have a software and services that are really easy easy, easy to use. And Apple, an iPhone is something like this, you know. I think uh, uh, if you make a service like, like iPhone, you don't, you don't need to have a department to uh, show them how it works, you know. People understand it. They are, they are, not, they are not, you know, uh, stupid. They are smart. So uh, this is what we're trying to do. And um, short story, when we started five years ago, and I, I met like hundreds of online stores in Czech Republic where I, where I live. I asked them, hey guys, you're successful, you growth, you know, you're like one or two years old company. How we work with the data? I said, okay, we know costs, we know revenue, and, uh, and once a year we check we are profitable or not. That's all. I said, oh, really? And how you measure the margins, how you measure the life, customer lifetime value? And I said, first of all, we don't know what is this, and if, second, we don't know how. Uh, so that was the reason why we started Monkey Data, and uh, and when they give them the the tool, which is one clip, uh, uh, because in, in one click you can easily install our tool and show them like dashboards with these several numbers. Immediately they were able to understand it, what is it, and how to how to use it for making decisions. And thanks for that, uh, these guys are able to grow much faster and be much more you know uh, competitive on these uh, on on several markets. So. As I mentioned, if the technology is easy to use and easy to understand, they are really smart and they understand what to do with that. You know? So I just want to say that if anybody wants to create startup and service uh, for SMEs, it's great. Let's do this. Uh, two numbers, as I promise. Uh, 40 of, more than 40% of small and medium-sized companies, let's say micro and small companies, um, uh, using at least two services, cloud-based services, which help them to improve their, their processes. You know, they are really open-minded and they are, they are really happy if they if are if they can meet new technology that could help them to improve their business. You know, this is first fact. Second fact is that they are, that are able more than 80% of these guys they are able to invest money into new technology in their companies. So I just want to say that they are not like, oh no, we, we don't know what is that, you know, because probably everyone has a mom which want to, we don't know how to use the email, how to use the Facebook, but it's not a situation. These guys, also mom and pops, they are really open-minded. And from my experience, they are really smart, my mom as well, uh, to do something and to, to bring the new, new, new technology. It just must be simple and easy to use and easy to understand. Last, and 20 seconds, perfect. Last slide, I picked up three uh, most uh, important, uh, or let's say, problems that our customers from SMEs uh, uh, facing with. First one is the data, as I mentioned. They need more data, so I, I appreciate it, you know, that I, I think that the GDPR is a great step. PSD2 from bank operation is really, really gets a good step because uh, open APIs from bank um, uh, data is really good for, uh, for creating new services for also SMEs. Second thing is the working capital because these businesses, they are very young, they are very sensitive to cash flow. So it's too risky for banks and uh, so they have like, and like too small and not, not scalable, so not interesting to VCs like technology startups. So it's really important to, to bring some uh, FinTech solution like, like it exists, but more fintech solutions for these guys. And last, not least, uh, it's a paperwork because they have to do thousands of you know papers of everything for managed companies. And something what 
will help them to improve accounting, you know, paperwork, uh, logistics, and so on. Anything, anything of these areas will help them to be focused on, on the most important thing, and, and that's it's a business, innovation, and uh, and making new products and services on the market. So, please uh, help us to build uh, the great environment for SMEs uh, and help them to grow. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was extremely uh, interesting, I have to say, uh, including this last slide on some of the specific uh, challenges that these companies uh, face. Um, so it really has given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I forgot to mention up front that you can ask questions on Slido or you can just raise your hand. So why don't you do that? So who's going to start? Go ahead. Thank you. Adam Pose and Peterson Institute. This was a great panel, um, and it's very focused in line with our earlier discussions about diffusion and small medium enterprises and all these things. But I was wondering if I could uh, follow up on Torsten's presentation a moment. I, I thought, I mean, obviously you and I overlap some, um, and, and I thought your descriptions of, of trust as a European virtue, particularly in the digital space, is very important. So I'm, I'm going to make a statement, but since I'm used to moderating, I will pretend it's a question. Um, <laughs> so, so two parts. Um, first, and this is for anyone on the panel, how can Europe sort of make itself the preferred platform taking advantage of this? There was a period 30 years ago when our British friends attracted the best financial services from around the world because they were seen as law well regulated. It didn't always go to just the cheapest or the least regulated. And so does GDPR and the other efforts Europe is making from a business perspective, can that become more attractive for, for compared to China or US models? And relatedly, this is something which comes out of Torsten's remarks about talent, you know, is one of the European opportunities that as China and the US and the UK and others close their borders, uh, maybe Europe can be the place to attract this generation of immigrant thinkers and immigrant entrepreneurs. Again, I know migration is not always well received here, but I would hope Europe would seize that opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a couple. Can you keep the microphone? Because I actually want to ask you a question. Uh, you're based in... in fact, we're taking a couple. <laughs> well, but listen, I mean, you're based in the U.S. now. Would, would in the U.S., would a similar discussion take place? I mean, do the, do the SMEs in the United States, they ha are they grappling as much with this as European ones are? Or is this a uniquely uh, European phenomenon? Um, I'm probably not the best person to answer that, but my impression is twofold. First, that the diffusion of technologies to SMEs, whether through buying the services of companies like these or through other means, is on average better than in Europe, and so it's a little bit less pressing. But to the degree that there is a government interface, uh, SMEs are mostly in Washington on the defensive basis. There isn't much in the way of positive industrial policy. Positive industrial policy tends to be more for defense contractors and very large businesses in the U.S., not for SMEs. Very good. So, I mean, uh, and, uh, presumably it's partly because you have a sort of a healthier, more dynamic market maybe around sort of digital um, um, services uh, so that companies can more easily... Um, uh, don't get too excited. I mean, do we have more uh, uh, questions? Uh, come on, don't be shy.